Welcome everybody to the second session, uh, which will be on uh, uh, EPD, the Eukaryotic Promoter Database. Uh, that's a relatively old resource, more than 30 years old. So I take the liberty to uh, start with uh, kind of more philosophical remarks. Obviously, if you want to uh, develop a database for something, uh, you should know what is your target. And uh, promoters are a difficult case in this respect because uh, it's an ill-defined term, a little bit like genes, uh, which uh, maybe have created more confusion than clarifications. So we probably should go back to, uh, to the origins it was introduced by Jacques Gaube and Mono, who defined it as a DNA sequence located upstream of a gene to which RNA polymerase binds and initiates uh, transcription. Uh, so, you know, it, the one question you could ask is whether this was a discovery or an invention, and another question you can ask uh, whether such uh, DNA sequences actually exist, and they do certainly exist in the case of uh, the La Copperon in E. coli. But uh, the problem is when people started to analyze eukaryotic promoters, uh, they, they, on the one hand, they thought promoters would be something very interesting to discover, but it also became, became clear uh, that uh, such things do not exist in eukaryotes. Uh, specifically, so the, the green, what is in green, that is actually applies to eukaryotic promoters as well. And what is red is false or only partially true. So in, in E. coli, uh, promoters are directly recognized by RNA polymerase in eukaryotes. That's not the case. And located upstream sometimes, but in the case, for instance, of tRNA genes, the promoters are said to be downstream. But again, uh, I'm now uh, referring to a specific sequence motif that is located downstream, uh, not necessarily to eukaryotic promoter in the modern sense. So the only definition that somehow works for eukaryotes and which uh, we applied in EPD when EPD was created is that a, D a promoter is a short DNA, a site or a short DNA region where POL2 initiates gene transcription. And, and note that I uh, uh, specified that it should initiate gene transcription and not just transcription because RNA polymerase can also uh, uh, initiate transcripts which are not uh, which do not uh, give rise to, um, to uh, RNA or protein products. So this is a theoretical uh, definition. I mean, it's something that we imagine is happening in the nucleus. But if you want to compile a database, you need an operational definition, which is based on experimental data. And here, the definition is it is a cluster of mRNA 5 prime ends mapped to the genome. Note also, I, no, this, this uh, thoughts about the definition um, basically have uh, created a situation where many people ask me, so why do you call it a promoter database? It is a transcription start site database. I, I think it, it would make sense. It would make things easier if nobody had introduced the term promoter for eukaryotes. But given the background, we call it a promoters. And, and this is, uh, is basically also reflected uh, by the newly coined term promoterom, which is used to describe, to refer to uh, the entirety of all uh, transcription initiation sites of a genome. Now, I should say gene is also an ambiguous term. I wanted to uh, add a remark that we recently extended EPD new to certain classes of non-coding RNAs. But most of EPD is, is really relates to uh, protein coding genes. 
I can. Okay, <coughs> let me give <coughs> a brief historical overview. It all started about uh, uh, how many years ago? Uh, almost 40 years ago, uh, when a compilation of about 60 eukaryotic promoters was published in a review article by Breznach and Jean Beau. And so, because I was interested at that uh, time in promoters, I typed in this compilation into a computer, a, a big one, about the size of a refrigerator, which had uh, six kilobases of memory. And uh, then I, I continued to update this collection uh, uh, with uh, new promoters that I found. Uh, reported in papers. So in 1986, we compiled, I, I started a PhD at the Weizmann Institute uh, in Israel at that time. We compiled a list of 168 uh, promoters in a paper in nucleic acids research. And uh, then I had the idea that maybe it would be better to publish uh, this in machine readable form and I contacted people of the MBL data library and they were very happy to put my text file onto their magnetic tapes. So then later in, so that's basically how it became a kind of uh, database in the modern sense. Although content wise, it was of course not different from the table that we published on paper. So in, in 97, uh, we introduced the web cyber server. Then uh, in, the, in 2005 to 2007, uh, we, uh, that means mostly Giovanna, developed the, uh, the SSA web interface and the Chipsec server. In, uh, somewhat later, we created the MGA, which is a structured, a more structured uh, data backend. And and then it became necessary to completely redesign EPD. EPD. So we changed the basic structure and also the maintenance uh, procedure. Uh, I will uh, uh, mostly uh, show you what, what you see today is EPD new. Uh, and in uh, 2020, EPD new covers 15 model organisms uh, from diverse eukaryotes. Oh, what is... I have problems switching. Okay, so the guiding principles of the old EPD database, which basically have not changed in its essence, but in the details very much. So promoter evidence, we accepted only experimental evidence, but under some under defined uh, rules, also homology inferred promoters. So this we don't do anymore in EPD new. Now an important assumption is that cat five prime ends of eukaryotic mRNAs actually uh, are created by transcriptional in initiation, uh, not by internal cleavage of an RNA. Uh, this is debatable, this has been debated, but if we don't make this assumption, we just have no data to make a database. So I won't comment much on this question. Um, the primary data source were journal articles. Uh, the experiments that were used at that time to characterize promoters are called R were RNA sequencing, nuclease protection, primary extension, with the uh, exception of RNA sequences, the other ones are not used anymore. What is important uh, to, uh, uh, to underline is that the contents is based on a, that it was based on a critical analysis of data shown, and that means mostly pictures, and not just on conclusions uh, reported by the authors. So it was a lot of work to uh, uh, read all these articles. Uh, the promoters, well, that's something uh, uh, very uh, uh, 
unusual at that time. We didn't represent promoters as sequences, although most people thought of promoters as sequences. We uh, represented them by pointers to uh, positions in sequences. And the purpose uh, was comparative analysis of promoter analysis. Uh, EPD was also used as training and test sets for promoter prediction algorithms. And we thought it would be a nice resource for bench biologists who are just interested in specific promoters of their uh, preferred genes. Uh, but I, I think we were not uh, so successful in uh, publicizing EPD with bench biologists. So just an example of the old experiments. You see the picture. This is a primer extension experiment. Uh, people used a primer inside somewhere in the upstream regions of the RNA and then reverse transcript, reverse transcribe this primer and put the products on a gel and you can with the parallel sequencing lane, you, you can a uh, Sanger sequencing lane, you, you can guess, you can map the transcription initiation site to the sequence. In this case, it's actually quite sharp. Um, what uh, you, you may not realize is that at that time, one promoter was worth a paper. So in order to compile, the 170 or 180 promoters in our first uh, publications, we had to read uh, that many papers. So this is uh, slightly repetitive. So my personal uh, motivation to create EPD was to the, was discovery and characterization of promoter motifs. And then other people's interests were more, uh, especially computational biologists were more uh, to use it as a training and test set for more promoter prediction. And what I want to say at this point is that actually the signal search analysis package uh, which Giovanna introduced uh, this morning was developed in parallel and highly synergistically with EPD. So basically, uh, if I wanted to characterize promoter motifs, I needed a data resource of promoters and I needed a software tool uh, to find the motifs. Uh, motif discovery in promoters wasn't so obvious as one could uh, think. Uh, in a typical motif discovery situation, you have uh, DNA sequences with a beginning and an end. And uh, you know that these sequences have some function or they have some biochemical uh, um, activity. And then you try to find a motif that is overrepresented within uh, these sequences. But with promoters, you don't know where the promoters start and where the promoters end. And this has not changed uh, since then. Uh, a promoter is, a, is an object which is mostly defined by a kind of center position, the TSS, or the major TSS, but which has very fuzzy borders. Uh, so that's why we basically, SSA is, has a different design from most other motif discovery programs. So, uh, to set up the, the problem of finding promoter motifs in a rigorous uh, way, I defined promoter motifs as the generate sequence patterns, which can be re represented by consensus sequences, possibly with mismatches allowed, or a position weight matrix, or maybe something more advanced. And the second element uh, in the definition is that these motifs must occur at the cons fixed or constrained distance from the transcription start site. And finally, they should uh, be overrepresented at, in this region relative to the start site in a statistically significant way. So that means the litmus test for promoter motifs is that they are locally overrepresented uh, at a certain a distance from the TSS and this overrepresentation is statistically significant or maybe just intuitively convincing 
by a motif occurrence profile as shown in the lower right corner of this slide, which is from a publication from 1990. So this figure was actually produced with OPROF with an earlier version, which produced somewhat different pictures. So actually, this was the main use of EPD. This is also what maybe what made it uh, popular uh, and which also uh, uh, called attention to my work. So in, in um, 1990, we published matrix descriptions of four major uh, vertebrate RNA pol 2 promoter elements, which we derived at that time from 500 U2 unrelated promoter sequences. And you see the sequence logos of these motifs below. Now things have changed and we have to, uh, we have to keep, uh, we really have to uh, uh, understand that the way biological research on uh, transcriptional regulation and uh, promoters in particular has completely changed. When I started EPD, uh, the data were produced by small labs, everything, all data. Uh, they, um, the, the technologies uh, that were available uh, were targeted at individual genes and usually uh, research groups were also interested in, in a specific gene and the data were published in journal articles piece by piece and then mid on late 90s uh, the a development started which i um, which one could call the the high throughput biology revolution the uh, two factors which contributed to this de development on the one hand the invention of high throughput technologies, which allowed, which was were applicable, which produced data in large amounts, and some of them were applicable to, uh, on a genome-wide scale. And the second um, uh, factor was the Human Genome uh, Project, which uh, publicized uh, the global approach. So you should go global. Uh, and associated with this was that the data uh, uh, from these, uh, from high throughput biology, they were no longer really uh, accessible through journals, maybe conclusions, statistical analysis results were published in journals, but the data as such were only available online in computer readable form. So this basically uh, made the, the traditional data collection uh, procedure by EPD uh, ineffective, mainly reading papers. So in, in recent times, the, the most significant technological advance in uh, gene regulation was the the introduction of uh, next, so-called next generation sequencing uh, technologies. Uh, they're obviously not any more next generations. They are more like previous generation, but the term has remained. And these assays, they, are, they produce huge, huge amount of data. They are all uh, applied genome-wise. And among the NGS-based assays, which contributed most to our understanding of promoters are CAGE, which uh, is a technology for quantitative uh, single base TSS mapping, um, ChIP-seq for mapping in vivo protein DNA interactions, and MNA-seq, uh, which allows the precise localization of nucleosomes. So, just uh, uh, a slide on, on CAP analysis of gene expression CAGE. Uh, on the left side, it's a it's, uh, schematic uh, uh, outline how the technology works. The essential part is that a method to separate messenger RNAs uh, from degradation products based on the presence of a cap structure. Then a linker is added to the cap structure uh, and from this linker, the sequences of the five prime ends of bona fide uh, complete transcripts are um, 
generated. Initially with a technology called Sage, but today obviously with uh, any of the popular short read sequencing technology, these reads are then mapped to the genome. So what is important about CAGE is that it is a quantitative uh, method to char characterize RNA. So it, in a way, it substitutes for other types of gene expression um, uh, assays like RNA-seq or microarrays. Uh, however, the advantage that it gives you uh, expression values, promoter-specific expression values. As you probably know, many eukaryotic promoters uh, have multiple, it, eukaryotic genes have multiple promoters, and these promoters often are regulated in a tissue-specific manner. And as a side product, this technology also provides a detailed picture of the transcription initiation pattern in the promoter regions, which may tell you something about the specific molecular mechanisms by which transcription is initiated and regulated. Now, CAGE is not the only uh, uh, massively parallel 5 prime end sequencing technology. Similar assays uh, have been uh, uh, Invented TSS seq is based on the oligo capping method uh, to uh, to sequence capped RNA. And interesting, more interesting is grow cap. This is this is a, a method which uh, sequence to sequence capped nuclear runoff tra, runon transcripts. Uh, this technology has some importance for all exotic organisms where. Uh, the, actually, the capped end of messenger RNAs do not derive from the promoter, but from a spliced needle that is uh, spliced onto the 5' prime region of the gene. This is true for C. elegans, for instance. So without crow cap, there will not be uh, EPD for C. elegans. Now, just to show you what CAP uh, does, you see uh, here the initiation patterns of two promoters uh, revealed by CAGE. You, on top, you see a narrow promoter where most transcripts actually initiate at exactly the same position. And below, there is a more broad promoter where the transcription initiation pattern is quite messy, I would say. Please have a look at the numbers at the scale on the right, on the left side, especially in the upper part. So the peak uh, represents 83,000 individual cage tags. So that is pretty high coverage. Now you can extrapolate it to maybe 30,000 promoter of the genome, and you realize how much information you get with a single CAGE experiment. And don't forget, CAGE uh, is applied uh, to tissue samples, so the CAGE uh, resources, they offer that level of resolution for hundreds of different tissue samples. MNA-seq is also a, an old technology, basically, which has been used for some time, which allows to, um, to separate uh, nucleosomes. So MNAs is a particular, as shown on the left side, is a particular nuclease, which uh, uh, does not attack uh, DNA, that is, wrapped around nucleosomes, but then precisely cuts at the borders of the nucleosome. So MNAs is uh, used basically as chip -seek. It is, it just cuts out, it produces nucleosomal fragments. Uh, the, the picture on the right is wrong in the sense that the overhanging green uh, fragments are far too long in MNA-seq. They would be very close to the protein DNA complex. But I, I also introduced, show this picture because uh, MNAC can be combined with ChIP-seq for histone marks, and in which case it gives 
it produces a high resolution mappings of subsets of nucleosomes which carry a certain mark. Now, MNA said a surprising, uh, led to a surprise uh, discovery, namely that a promoter have a very specific arch nucleosome architecture. Left, you see the picture that was obtained for yeast, and on the right side, a similar picture uh, for human, which we published uh, some time ago. So you should, uh, the, the black curve shows the distribution obtained uh, after well, the, the two, the, the red and the, and, and the green curves basically show the distribution obtained with the five prime and the three prime tag. So the red curve marks the beginning of a nucleosome and the green curve, uh, the, the end of the nucleosome. At that time, we did not yet shift the tags. So, <clears throat> NGS has really changed our views of promoters. Uh, some new insights gained. Cage uh, revealed that not only promoters but also enhancers are transcribed by polymerase 2. And Chipsic uh, allowed us to identify uh, promoter specific uh, histone marks uh, like H3K4. ME3 and to uh, investigate the function uh, of histone marks in a more systematic manner. And finally, MNACK has revealed that active promoters are nucleosome free. This was suspected, but not really uh, demonstrated, and that they are flanked by position nucleosomes on the downstream side. Now, I should say something about uh, position nucleosomes. Uh, maybe let's go back to the previous figure. It's not, it wasn't clear, it's still uh, not entirely clear uh, in general whether nucleosomes in different cells or on sister chromosomes within the same cells actually occupy the same positions or whether they randomly uh, fill up uh, the chromosomes uh, and uh, at just at leaving spaces between them of variable lengths of uh, 10 to 50 base pairs. Now, what today is clear that in a large part of the genome, nucleosomes are completely randomly positioned, maybe 80%, maybe 60%. Um, I'm speaking of human, not of yeast. And if the nucleosome would be randomly positioned if they, I mean, in any cell, on any chromosome, obviously the nucleosome occupies a very specific site at any given time. But if they would occupy different positions in different cells, then we would see a completely flat pattern in this plot. And so these peaks, they actually mean that for a large number of promoters, at least, the nucleosomes occur at precisely the same positions relative to the TSS. And this is uh, specifically the, the case in, in the downstream regions. So in response to the high throughput uh, biology revolution, uh, the time has come where we came to the conclusion, conclusion that we need to completely redesign uh, EPD. This doesn't necessarily mean that we would not stick to the basic principles, like that we rely exclusively on ex experimental data, so we wouldn't use uh, sequence-based predictions, or that we base the, da the, the data contents on quality-controlled data and the like, uh, but it meant that we would completely uh, uh, change the procedure uh, to generate the data and also choose new formats and new ways to link uh, the promoters to experimental data. Uh, so 
that's why in the years 2001 to 2002, we completely uh, redesigned EPD uh, from scratch. And so that means that we, during a short time period, we had uh, basically two databases uh, in, in parallel, uh, which were used. Uh, but in the meantime, EPD new has completely superseded EPD and, EPD and so we call it a, again EPD. Here the design principle. So uh, since we didn't have uh, uh, a large labor force uh, at our disposal, so uh, EPD new was designed to be a light resource that would be most effective in terms of maintenance. Uh, unlike the uh, old EPD database, we focused on model organisms. So we decided uh, that has to do with the fact that uh, now e EPD is based on the data with, uh, obtained with technologies that characterize the genome at once. So that was not the case before. So that uh, means that uh, we, there are relatively few organisms for which we have uh, genome-wide data. And then uh, it, we switch to automatic extraction of promoter information from uh, high throughput data. Uh, so, but that, um, that obviously is dangerous. I mean, it, it, the danger is garbage in, garbage out. And so we, we complemented the automatic uh, procedures with stringent quality control of the input data. And the stringent quality control of the input data is still largely done uh, in an in a intuitive uh, and manual manner. So we also do visual and automatic checks of the output uh, database. And if they don't look okay, so then we change the extraction procedure. Uh, we uh, have uh, an entry viewer, which is now mostly based on the UCSC genome browser. Um, but uh, in this uh, viewer, we add homemade uh, custom tracks. Uh, Promoter selection and analysis tools are offered by independent resources, uh, namely the GIPSIC and SSA servers. And information on promoter structure is not anymore hard coded in the database itself. It's delivered uh, by on the fly integration tools accessing the MGA repository. And we also, uh, for the web server mostly, we made it more interoperable uh, with external resources uh, through direct navigation buttons. So uh, the goals are in, in a way very similar. Uh, we still, uh, there are, we now can see there's two major Objectives. One is to produce an accurate TSS collection for a selected number of model organisms. And if I, I probably should have said uh, high quality rather than accurate. So high quality in terms of comprehensiveness, higher enrichment in true promoters, whatever that means, and high accuracy uh, in the TSS mapping itself. Uh, the target users are computational biologists, genomics researchers. Now, the second and main part of EPD is now uh, a viewer uh, for viewing promoters as such and related uh, chromatin data. And the viewer is meant uh, to provide a useful data selection of CAGE, GIPSEC, MNAs, seq data, and additional data and also to provide an optimal data display in the UCSC uh, genome browser. Uh, the target users for the viewer are more wet lab biologists interest in specific genes. Now, and third, we, we, the, 
We deploy promoter selection and analysis tools via accessory resources. Uh, there's still a, a, a search page where, where promoters can be selected on the basis of hard-coded information in the DNA in the EPD database. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, we delegate the selection and analysis tools to the GYPSIC and SSA server, which obviously can be applied to other genomic features than promoters. So in particularly, we can select uh, promoters on the basis of motif content, uh, chromatin state, and, in, and, any, and basically any uh, uh, type of additional uh, genomic information. And still we can, uh, we offer uh, promoter relevant data uh, for download in, from the mass genome annotation data repository. The target users for promoter selection and analysis tools are of course uh, everybody, experimental biologists and computational biologists. Now this is the most important slide of my talk. It's a busy slide uh, and it, it explains uh, uh, in principle everything you, you, you should, you have to know about EPD new uh, in order to understand what it is. So it all starts with external data uh, from, uh, for instance, from GEO, uh, from Ensemble, from EDI. And in particular, we need as input uh, cage data or similar data and uh, gene annotation catalogs uh, like the gen code uh, gene catalog. Now, these uh, data, they go to a qu quality evaluation control and some never make it into the MGA data repository. I, Listed here EPD MGA data repository, but the EPD is not really necessary because most of the data in the MGA repository are somehow relevant to promoters. Now, from there, we do a second sele selection step uh, to uh, select the input data for the EPD assembly pipeline. This is the computational pipeline that takes uh, they, some data as input and in the end uh, creates a catalog of uh, promoters with consensus or TSS positions. Uh, so the, the output of the EPD assembly pipeline is then evaluated uh, we have a motif-based evaluation and we have, we do also manual checks. So what usually happens is that after a first trial, we are not happy. So the quality control steps provide feedback and sometimes the feedback uh, uh, prompts us to remove uh, a data set from the EPD source data because we realize that it is of bad quality or, or it has some other disadvantages. And sometimes uh, we may add some additional data. And, but most of the fine tuning then goes into the uh, assembly, uh, in the computational processing pipeline. And we repeat these cycles typically two to three times, and then we tend to be happy or we don't see any improvement in terms of quality control. So I'm now going to say a little bit more on the elements um, uh, shown on this slide. The first element is the MGA repository. So Joanna already uh, told many things uh, about it, so this may duplicate. First, it is an FDP. Um, accessible directory. Uh, it is hierarchically organized at three levels, genome assembly, series, and samples. All data are in SGA format. Um, 
And uh, for each series, there is a HTML documentation file. And then, then this, all, this describes the source data, the samples, and also the reformatting procedures that we use to generate our productive version of the data. Uh, the MJ repository is accessible from EPD, it's accessible from SSA, it's accessible also uh, from the chip 6 server and additional tools we have developed. And the interface, that, that's an important point. Um, the interface with the web servers uh, is uh, achieved through machine readable data description files. So each subdirectory in the MGL repository has two uh, data description files, one that describes the series and one that describes all the samples. And the menus you see both in the Chipsec server and on the SSA server, they are automatically generated by reading these data description files, which are in the MGA repositories. And if you are curious what they look like, then you just have to go, can go to the FTP site and uh, look at these uh, data description files. Now, the MGA, note that the MGA provides the source data for EPD, and that is mostly cage data and other uh, high throughput transcription start site mapping data, but it also uh, provides the complementary functional genomics data for promoter analysis and for promoter selection. Now, just a very brief overview over the MGA. It contains primary data, GIPSI, chromatin accessibility, DNA methylation, not much for the moment, and, and transcription profiling uh, data. We call it now transcription profiling because it is only uh, it contains only data that are related to uh, the transcriptional process and which are collinear uh, with the uh, genome. So we we exclude RNA seq data that uh, are produced from spliced cytoplasmic RNA. Then it contains also derived data. So we consider GIPSIC peaks, uh, for instance, published peak clicks like peak lists, like the peak list uh, from ENCODE. Um, and genome annotations such as promoters, splice junctions, and the like. And we also have a, a very interesting and diverse section called sequence intrinsic. These are features that are computed from genome sequences only. They don't need any additional experiments in addition to the genome sequence. Uh, those include cross-species conservation scores, uh, geno genome variation data, like uh, SNPs, for instance. So <coughs> let, let me say a few words on <coughs> GPD assembly pipeline. So <coughs> the goal is to identify promoters. And promoters are defined not as single transcription start site, but as transcription initiation regions. And underlying is a certain assumption about the size of a promoters. So we think that a promoter can be as large as about 100 base pairs or maybe 150 base pairs. That's uh, maybe what corresponds to the largest transcription start site clusters we observe, clusters that, clusters that are clearly associated with a gene. And for, for these clusters, we try to uh, select the most representative single initiation site. Often we choose the one which is uh, most used, uh, but uh, in general, we, you, we take the one that is most used, but usage is in a specific way averaged over all tissues that are available. So that's how it works. Uh, this is uh, an old slide. Uh, up, up. 
which refers to uh, uh, version three of uh, EPD new. Now we are at version six, but the principle is the same. So the input data is a gene catalog. At that time we used UCSC known genes and primary TSS data, these are cage libraries in general. The, the primary T TSS data, oh, okay, they, they undergo a read mapping step and then we do kind of peak calling and identify clusters of transcription initiation sites. Uh, the UCSC gene catalog is filtered based on some uh, uh, criteria. So uh, for instance, we still treat, we basically filter for protein coding genes. The recently, uh, the recent collections for non-coding RNA promoters uh, are based on a separate pipeline with filters for that kind of genes. And we also uh, eliminate pseudogenes or genes which are incomplete or where the coding region, where the initiation codon is missing or other strange things. And then basically we map the peak, the cage tag peaks to, uh, to genes by proximity. Uh, many of the peaks fall through either because they are not near any gene or because they are just a little bit too far away from a gene. We require uh, a distance range of about 100 base pairs relative to a, to a gene start annotated in the gene catalog. So this leads uh, to a validated list of transcription start sites for each individual cage library. And then we basically do a kind of similar procedure uh, for the TSS uh, obtained from each samples. Note that we now have many, we, are reached, we probably have more than thousand, we have more than thousand samples. So we merge this and we take not the promoter which has the highest number of uh, cage tags in total, but the one which was selected as the major promoter in the highest number of samples. And that leads to a new uh, EPD promoter collections, which contains uh, the reference TSS site for uh, uh, genes. Sorry. So now uh, we go to the evaluation. So I will, okay, this slide uh, shows you uh, the, the primary data for the current uh, version of EPD. So we now use GenCode as the gene catalog. We also use a new data type called Rampage. This is a technology which uh, is based on, based on paired end sequencing. And it's actually uh, meant to uh, directly associate the kept five prime end with a transcript uh, which uh, uh, to which the three prime end of the of the same fragment uh, matches. As you can see on the tags, uh, the number of tags are pretty astronomic. I mean, uh, we have now uh, over nearly 40 billion individual cage tags. Now to motif, the evaluation, I will show just motif-based evaluation. So we uh, introduced this procedure about 15 years ago. So the principle is that we know actually that specific motifs are overrepresented at characteristic distances from the TSS. These motifs are, for instance, the Tata box or, or the initiator site. And then we say that the height of a motif peak is, is indicated of promoter enrichment in the collection. Of course, if I say enrichment, uh, we we target something like 95 or 98%. So, uh, and the width of a motif peak is indicating of 
indicative of the precision of the TSS mapping. So the result of this, uh, of this evaluation procedure is a statistical quality measure for a promoter collection as a whole. It is not a method that would allow you to decide whether an individual promoter is actually a true or a false one. So in that sense, it's not an evaluation procedure for promoters, it's an evaluation procedure for the computational pipeline that extracts promoters from high throughput data. And unfortunately, uh, we don't know the absolute enrichment figure because we only get uh, relative values. But of course, we, the visual checks we do, they indicate that the enrichment is very high. Uh, there are some caveats with this procedure, uh, especially if we compare uh, promoter collections between different organisms. In, in the first EPD release published in 1986, 70% of all promoters contain a Tata box. And today we are down at 10%. So why, why this is the case? Uh, it, it's the case because uh, the initial sets were biased by strong promoters. At that time, you could only characterize uh, a promoter if you were able to uh, extract tons of messenger RNAs. This is the case for uh, genes like beta globin, uh, where most of the messengers in a cell is encode for beta globin, also for hormones, insulin, ovalbumin, and the like. So uh, the, this means that one has to pay attention. Uh, an enrichment in a motif also may mean that we favor, for instance, highly expressed uh, promoters, which we do not want. So this is an example. Below uh, is, is the peak, the signal occurrence profile, again, uh, generated with OPROF uh, for an EPD, for the current EPD release uh, for comparison is the, the same figure obtained for gene starts from, from a gene catalog. So you see a very sharp peak indicating that the mapping is precise, but as said before, uh, the number of, of uh, promoters which contain a Tata box is not extremely high. Actually, this is for an older release, it has increased a little bit. Now, note that this, this is a screenshot from the EPD website. The EPD website uh, uh, posts the quality, this type of quality report for each data collection. Now, the second important element of uh, EPD is the EPD promoter viewer. Um, so the entry point for the user is a single HTML page with essential information and links. So uh, the contents of the page is text-based annotations, genome coordinates, gene symbols, and the like. A picture of the genomic contextual feature, this is a, a picture downloaded from UCSC, a link to the to UCSC for dynamic visualization and hyperlinks to other resources, for instance, uh, Swiss Regulon. Now, the graphical interface is UCSC genome browser based. Uh, uh, it has EPD supplied custom tracks, uh, for instance, for display of cage data, and it also uh, provides a customized view. So the implementation is as a public truck, truck hub, hub. So this is a, a structure that has been introduced by UCSC. So it's a, it's a structured and annotated collection of homemade data tracks in standard uh, 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 genome browser track formats uh, like BigWig and BigBed. Now a truck, truck hub can be a temporarily connected to the UCSC genome browser by uh, in various mechanisms, directly from the browser menu or automatically through uh, HTML links. Uh, 
the EPD viewer is also uh, uh, based on a configuration and annotation files in text format and all data freely downloadable via a URL. So <clears throat> the viewer configuration file, it's called a session in UCSC terminology, triggers the connection uh, of the browser to external, public or private track hubs. It defines which tracks are displayed or hidden. It defines also how the tracks should be displayed and in what order. And the session files, uh, they can be manually uploaded or automatically via a URL. So I think now it's time to uh, go to a demonstration uh, on on the web server. So let me try to, uh, to switch to another screen. Okay, so this is the EPD uh, uh, homepage. So if you want to access the viewer, you click on an organism. And then on this, on this page, you see some summary information. For instance, you have uh, 29,000 genes, uh, promoters for 16,000 genes, and you have a picture on this side. Now, this is uh, the UCSC, a snapshot of the UCSC view. You can click on this picture, and then you are in the UCSC browser. So, the, this shows a selection of tracks. Some of the tracks are hosted by UCSC. Others come from the EPD uh, track hub. If you scroll down, you see the EPD viewer hub and you see uh, the menu uh, of the different components, showing the different components. So let me go uh, through the tracks. Uh, you see on top histone on modifications. So what you see in this example is that you have positioned and H3K4 ME3 labeled nucleosomes on this side or on, oh, sorry, on both sides. So that's probably because we have two promoters uh, which uh, direct transcription in different directions. So then we have a um, uh, track, sorry. This is a histone modification tracks, uh, specifically H3K2, H3K27 acetylation, which is supposed to reflect the activity of the promoters, not only of promoters, but also of enhancers. If you are, if you are interested what's going on, you can change, of course, the display mode. And instead of transparent, you, you choose none. And now you see the different tracks uh, separately. Uh, you see that uh, this promoter appears to be highly active in the UVEC uh, cell. So if you go further down, we see actually the cage profiles at single base resolution. Uh, this is actually uh, the distribution if you combine all uh, the cage libraries. And here you have a, a, a tissue specific view in dense uh, display for HeLa cells, which look pretty much the same. We have three collections, so we have ENCODE CAGE, we have ENCODE RAMPAGE, and we have Phantom uh, uh, 5. For Phantom 5, uh, you, you, we have uh, one of the tracks. Now, what we, if you are interested in, in tissue-specific CAGE usage, then you can display more tracks. Sorry. So, for instance, you, you can activate all 
plus tracts, and you should go. You should keep it dense, and then you will see lots of tracks. Hmm? Um, that's not what I wanted. You reset the results first. What? By mistake, by mistake you reset. Okay, so let's try configure. I don't want full. And I want to activate all. Okay, let's try again. So this takes a little bit of time because there are hundreds of, uh, of libraries, but actually not too much because the browser only ac ac accesses the data for a particular region. But I still don't see it. Scroll down, maybe? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, it, it put it, okay, yeah, sorry, I put it at the end. So here you have all, all the data, so you can choose your, your uh, sample. And you also get an impression where it is strongly expressed, but I would say in this case it's uh, largely a constitutive promoter. You see additional transcription start sites in some tissues, and you can explore them individually. So, okay, so what else can you do? You can also zoom in on the initiation patterns to, to get the... So now you see how the, the, uh, the transcription starts are actually distributed and you see that they are actually not so... Uh, not so sharp. There, there are several sites, they tend to be uh, the same in different collections, although there are some differences between uh, ENCODE and, and Phantom. But the major site is always the same, and this is the site which is indicated by this EPD icon, uh, which uh, shows 10 base pairs of the RNA, uh, by a thick bar and then 50 base pairs of the upstream region by a thinner line. Okay, then you can also, uh, you have DNA sensitive clusters and you have um, um, additional data. I will, I will now switch, I will go back. Let me... I will go back to this uh, uh, promoter database home page. As you can see, we have additional viewers. For instance, this was the viewer for Genome Assembly 38, but we also have a viewer for uh, for uh, HG19. Uh, now, because I want to look at the same promoter, I click again on this promoter and I use the menu which is below the picture. You will also see that I have the, cho the choice between the UCSC uh, uh, server and the European Mirror. Now, usually, the data transfer is faster with the European mirror, so if you are based in Europe, I suggest that you use the European mirror. Now let's look at the viewer for HG19, because there are some tracks which I like better in the HG19 viewer. Uh, 
Well, I said it's faster than UCS than the UCSC. Well, it's not so fast. Well, I don't know, but okay. So the picture is the same, uh, more or less the same. What we have in the European viewer is this transcription factor uh, chipsic track, which I now I'm going to expand. No, full opaque is fine. So now we chose uh, Chipsic peaks uh, from ENCODE and the color meaning uh, dark black means a strong peak and light gray means a weak peak. Uh, you also see uh, these green parts. These green uh, areas correspond to a sequence most motif from the factor database. So we can look what kind of, interestingly, what we find here is we find CTCF sites with motifs, and we find uh, ELK4, which is a member of the ETS family. This is not a very strong peak, by the way, but ELF has a, you know, you see ELF is another member of the ETS family. Uh, which uh, uh, is strong. And if you click on this icon, well, okay, then we get the summary uh, from ENCODE. But this peak has been found in four different cell types, quite different cell types. And you see that in this one, it's relatively weak, but it's a very strong peak. In, uh, in the other uh, three cell types, including the lymphoblastoid cell line GM12878, which has been extensively characterized by ENCODE. You will then also see the sequence motif and have and some documentation. Not surprisingly, we see somewhere a peak for RNA polymerase, but I no okay here. So we can also look at this one. And here we see, uh, obviously, it's found in a lot of cell types. And you can maybe assume that the coverage by RNA polymerase may also give you some indication about the uh, activity of the promoters. Now, further below is the sequence conservation profile. So this is derived from cross-species comparisons. I guess these strong areas, they correspond to exon, exons, but there are also some spikes in the promoter region. So it's always interesting to uh, check whether some of these short regions which are conserved exactly coincide with transcription factor binding sites. So let's zoom in on, on a short region. So what you can see here is that apparently there is a, a transcription factor binding site. It is for ELK4, for ELF1, and for ELK1, and for GABPE. Now, I, these are all uh, transcription factors of the ETS family, and they have virtually identical binding specificity. So the motifs are basically the same. But obviously, these are different proteins, and so different members uh, of, um, of the ELK family may recognize the same sequence motif in the same 
promoter. And what is really nice here is the precise uh, uh, correspondence of the elk motif and the conservation peak. You can assume that this peak is probably also conserved. But now going back, going back to the to these motifs, if you are interested, so if you are interested in which cell type elf binds uh, to this motif, you click on this. And here are the cell types we saw before. So it's not many actually. And maybe GABPA uh, is, is uh, binding this motif in other cell types, let's see. Not necessarily, because these two we saw before. I think Hela was not present. But uh, so that would indicate that the same motif is recognized by different members of the same transcription factor family in the same cells. Now, I, I didn't want to give a lecture uh, about uh, its one family members, the motifs of these proteins and, and the role in promoters. I just wanted you to show how you can dig in uh, on biology by using the EPD uh, viewer. Uh, I then now the, obviously you can do uh, all these things without going through EPD. So we see our mission to provide you with a with a useful uh, subset uh, of tracks that we automatically activate through the session file. And you may so, and which may be helpful to you in the sense that you will get to this use to this view uh, as a starting point where you can find uh, interesting information. The, the UCSC default view is not tuned to a particular um, user community, so it, it contains a much broader uh, mixture of tracks and it is then more difficult for ordinary users to find those which are particularly interesting, interesting to, uh, to their domain. So we see uh, our role as kind of guides to interesting genome information for people who are interested in promoters. There's note that we also have uh, a cell type specific viewer. Uh, we, we plan to add more cell type specific viewer in the future. For the lymphoblastoid cell line uh, GM12878. So here you have histone marks only for this cell type. And obviously you have the cage data, you have all cage data. And then you have, um, you, you have DNAs one uh, data and the DNAs one data, there is something interesting. Uh, it's this single base resolution track, which is available from UCSC directly. In principle, this gives, shows you the fine structure of the promoter region. So wherever you have high signal, the, the DNA is probably not occupied by a protein complex. And where you have low signal, it may be occupied. So black is highly accessible uh, and uh, low signal is, uh, is protected. And you could speculate, I don't know whether it's true, that here you have a kind of valley and this maybe correspond to the area 
where the pre-initiation complex is assembled on the promoter and it may coincide with the polymerase one peaks. Okay, let me switch back uh, to the slide collection. Okay, this is just uh, the slides for the promoter view. You have seen this. Now I'll show you a few more examples uh, of interesting promoters. So this is a case where, you ha where we have uh, a tissue specific promoter use in particular. There is a strong promoter which uh, appears in, uh, in two uh, cancer cell lines. It is shown on the, sorry, on this side. And this promoter is absent in most other cell types. Uh, so this is related. Repetitive elements or in principle contain promoter regions. They are typically acti inactivated uh, in, in some ways, but in cancer cells, sometimes they become active again. And so this is recorded as a promoter on EPD, is as an alternative promoter of the main promoter. So this is also a quite interesting case. So this is from zebrafish. And um, so we it's, a it's a time course, it's cage data uh, for, a, for a time course. And what you see is that in, a, in the site, zygotic samples. Uh, you have to know that in early development, messenger RNA transcription starts at a later stage. The initially during the initial cell division uh, events, uh, protein synthesis relies on maternal messengers. So the maternal messengers, they apparently start here. And interestingly, there is a Tata box or kind of a Tata box uh, near, no, sorry, yes, yeah, near this uh, site. And then at uh, later stages, uh, transcription initiation switches to this place. So this is just a summary of the promoter analysis tools. Uh, uh, I, I think I can more or less skip uh, this slide. Uh, you have seen CHIPCO, you have seen CHIP Extract, and you also have seen OPROF. Uh, and then these tools or related tools can be used as promoter subset uh, selection tools. You will see how to, you can do it in an in a exercise uh, this afternoon. Uh, but basically, you can use all the data that, that are available in the MGA repository to uh, do promoter selection, to select subsets which are enriched in a certain feature or subsets that are depleted in a certain feature. You can do this with chip crop followed by a, a, a feature selection menu. But there's also Find Them. It's a program from the SSA patch. It works in a similar way as OPROF, but rather than plotting a profile of, uh, of uh, motif occurrences, it selects promoters that contain a certain motif. Um, and these tools can be uh, uh, used in a, in a cascade. So again, this is partly redundant. So for instance, here we look at histone modifications in EPD promoters. So this is the input form. We have seen this already with Giovanna. We select EPD. EPD is available uh, from both the SSA and chip 6 server menus. Then we select uh, histone modification from this data set. And this produces this picture. Uh, the feature selection tool appears on the output page. So you could use, uh, this is not a good example for, uh, not the best example uh, to illustrate it. So with this tool, you can select the promoters which uh, 
have between minus 500 and 500 more than 100 mapped tags. So this would be uh, uh, the more strongly labeled promoters. You can also just enter in the select top and rich depleted reference features. You can uh, say you want to select a thousand uh, top enriched features and you can switch it. You can uh, switch to depleted feature selection, which allows you <coughs> to select promoters that are weakly covered uh, by this histone mark, or it could also be uh, a transcription factor uh, site. Now, if you if you use this tool, you know, then, okay. Uh, If you use this tool, then you get uh, a new page uh, where you have the promoter that have been selected and you can do whatever you want with the promoters uh, that are highly enriched in H3, K4, ME3. You can use uh, uh, chip extract to uh, look at the heterogeneity which is hidden behind a general uh, aggregation plot and you can see if you if you extract the tags uh, for individual promoters and you cluster them by k-means then you see very distinct classes of promoters promoters that have strongly positioned uh, h3 k4 me 3 label nucleosome on the downstream side promoters that have such new on both sides and a large number of promoters which do not have, uh, which still do not have this mark. Now, this, uh, you can also look at nucleosome data and this is just uh, uh, a picture you obtain if you analyze the nucleosome positions in yeast relative to transcription start sites. Actually, no, it is not yeast, it is, uh, it is fission yeast, Saccharomyces uh, pombi. And you can use SSA to look at the enrichment of uh, specific uh, uh, transcription factor, factor binding sites in human promoters. So that's how you fill out uh, the form. We do this in the exercise in the afternoon. And that is the picture uh, you get as a result. Note that you can require uh, to do the same analysis for shuffled sequences. Shuffling is regional. It means that we, the computer uh, takes each sequence, uh, cuts it into 10 maze pair windows and changes the order of the basis in each uh, window. This preserves, is supposed to preserve the base composition. And this is sometimes important because promoters are highly GC rich. And GC rich uh, transcription factor binding motifs may only be overrepresented because they are GC rich. But here, this is not the case. The shuffled sequences show a flat uh, distribution and and a Y binding site uh, are highly uh, enriched. Some concluding remarks. So, uh, EPD together with the MGA ChIP-seq and SSA is actually, can be viewed as a data integration hub and uh, data analysis platform. So for instance, if you're interested about the promoter uh, uh, or in a group of promoters, you may ask questions like in which tissue are they active, what sequence motifs do, do occur, how are nucleosomes arranged, and are, whether there are SNPs near the TSS. And these answers can basically be obtained on the fly um, by accessing data that are in the uh, MJ repository or by running uh, tools uh, or by to by on-the-fly motif analysis 
uh, in genome sequences. And I think this design has a major importance over a static conventional database. Uh, the, inv the individual resources can be asynchronously maintained. Uh, so we don't have, if, if we have a, uh, a new data set, a uh, GIPSIC data set, we don't have to add this to ET EPD. We add it simply to the MGA repository and then it will automatically be uh, linked to EPD and analyzable via EPD. Uh, uh, we can use software that is useful for other purposes, that is also relates to the uh, independence maintenance um, uh, argument. So we have not necessarily developed ChIP-seq for EPD, but it is very useful for EPD. And that's why we think there's no point in developing a more specialized tool for EPD. Uh, the on-the-fly combination of uh, or assembly of information about promoters also makes the information more traceable to the primary data. It offers a lot of flexibility to the end user uh, and it's label uh, efficient at the developer's end. We also try to make EPD open science and so the general principle is that all components should be uh, open source and, and publicly accessible. Uh, the MJ repository is a, is a is an open uh, FTP accessible uh, directory. Uh, the source URLs uh, and are given for all the scripts that were available um, that have been used for data uh, reformatting. The web applications they post, uh, you may not have noticed it, a link to the script that has been run on the server. So if something funny occurs, you may be able to trace uh, it back. You can also copy the script to your computer and run the same analysis um, then uh, with the command line tools. We also try to provide the numerical data for all the graphics so that you can make nicer graphics with R, and in EPD, we try to provide a precise description of the assembly pipelines. It's not yet a reproducible files, and of course, we link to all the source data. And with this, I come to an end of my talk, and I want to say thank you to all the people that recently have worked so hard on these tools. Raida was our quality control manager, uh, Giovanna uh, did almost everything on the accessory tools. Rene and Patrick Mela, uh, for which I have no photo, unfortunately, have been the main EPD developers. And Romain Gru was a PhD student, uh, which had his own project, but also helped uh, on many occasions to make our resources better. Now, these are not the people who created EPD in the first place, even though they, these are the people who, who developed uh, EPD new. But this would not have been possible with the former team members, Claude Bonnard, Vivian Pra, Thomas Junier, and Christoph Schmid, uh, who uh, also uh, did, a, did a tremendous job. They created the first web interface and then started uh, to um, develop the um, automatic procedures. So I'm not sure whether we have uh, five minutes time for questions. Uh, Patricia, or what do you think? I think we have time for questions, no?